Let's talk a little bit about Tanya, because it is an amazing study. Every Jew, every non-Jew, would benefit greatly from studying Tanya. And what's really amazing is that it was written 200 years ago in a completely different world, you would think. And yet it's relevant, up close and personal, to today, to us, without, without a lot of reinterpretation, just the way it's written. So the entire Tanya was based on a simple question. In the Torah it is written, Moses says, Moshe says to the people, serving God is not a foreign thing. It's not distant. It's very natural. It's not in heaven. You don't have to go to heaven. And it's not across the ocean. You don't have to cross oceans. It is very close to your mouth and heart. Which means that it is very natural for you to serve God with your heart. With your heart means emotions. That's love and fear. So the Rebbe asks the simple question. Moshe says it is very natural, but is it? We don't find it natural. It's rather unnatural to love God. It's natural to love yourself. So what did Moshe mean when he said, it is very natural to serve God with your heart. And to explain this and to answer this question, he devotes the entire Tanya. Apparently, what the Rebbe is doing is saying, if you knew yourself, you would see that it is natural for you to love God because you have a godly soul as well as a natural soul, and the godly soul is is obviously godly, it's a godly soul, and uh, it has a natural connection to God, and it wants nothing more than to be connected to God, and to cleave to God, and so on. And all you have to do is uncover that soul, uncover that side of you, and you naturally love God. But to back up a little bit, the Tanya was written as a book of advice for people who had serious, painful questions. Their questions were not doubts. They weren't asking the Rebbe to resolve their doubts. We're talking 200 years ago in Russia. People didn't have doubts. <laughs> they had no doubts. They knew they were going to suffer. <laughs> there was no doubt about it. Life was going to be miserable. So they had no doubts. So what questions did they have that they urgently needed answered? Their question was how to serve God best. Now again, we're talking about people who were believers. We're talking about people who were committed. We're talking about people who were observant. You can't call them orthodox because that word didn't exist in those days. <laughs> You were either doing or not doing what you're supposed to do. There were no titles. So they were all basically observant, practicing, believing, devoted Jews. Why else would they turn to the Rebbe for advice? And what advice did they need? How to serve God. Well, what's the question? You put on tefillin, you keep kosher, you keep Shabbos, you light the candles, you go to the mikveh. What do you mean how to serve God? It's all written. Open the book and take a look. 613 commandments. Pick a mitzvah, any mitzvah. And start. What was that question that was bothering them? Obviously they knew what to do. What was bothering them is, how do I turn these activities into a service. It's like in a marriage. The husband does everything he needs to do. He supports his wife, he's good to his wife, he helps, he takes out the garbage. <laughs> but, but the relationship, I mean, it's functional because he does all the right things. 
But can you call this a relationship? Is this called serving? Or is this called going about your life? So yes, we can do all the mitzvahs, and we should do all the mitzvahs, and they were doing all the mitzvahs. Their question was, what can I bring to the relationship that would make it my service? Doing what he says, well, that, that's all his idea. What do I bring to it? And of course the answer is love, fear, awe, compassion, all the good qualities that we have, put it all into the observance of these mitzvahs. But how do you do that? And that's why the Rebbe picked on that particular verse that says, it is natural for you to serve God with your heart. But it doesn't seem to be that. So let me explain it. Now when you have this question, Torah says, and everything Torah says is true, Torah says it is very natural for a Jew to serve God with love. Now you look at the facts on the ground, and it's not happening. So where might the problem be? There are two players here. There's the Jew and God. You're telling me that every Jew loves God. I don't see it. I don't see it happening. So where might the problem be? Well, either in the Jew. If a Jew was really a Jew, he would love God naturally. Or the problem is with God. I would naturally love God, but he's not lovable. So if the statement is true, then one of the two players in the sentence is out of line. Either the Jew is not really in touch with himself, or the God he believes in is just not lovable. You got the wrong God. If you had the right God, you, you would love him. You got the wrong God, and he's not lovable. So what do you expect? What would make God unlovable? two things. If we make God completely human, then there's nothing impressive and there's no reason to get excited about him. If you make God divine, well then he's so far removed from my reality, what is there to love? So what are we to make of, of God that would enable us to love him? So the first part of Tanya describes the inner workings of the Jewish psyche so that you know who you are and find the love that you carry within you and work with it. The second part of Tanya tells you what God really is. A God that is lovable. And in that way we cover both possibilities. So here are, the, here are the two things. One statement about Jews, one statement about God. The statement about a Jew is that while everything was created, everything in the world, including our bodies, including our natural human soul, which is mortal, that's why we're afraid of dying, <laughs> that's why we have a survival instinct, While everything was created by, by divine speech, God said, let there be, and there was. God said, let us make man, made man. The godly soul that a Jew has is not created. It is not part of creation. It is a piece of God that he invests in his creation. I mean, you can say the same thing about any creation. The painter. Well, the painting is not him. The painting is an, is an inanimate object. It's not the painter. 
but there's something about the painter that is invested in his painting. And that's why you can recognize famous painters by their works. Because they each put their own stamp on it, they put themselves into it to some degree. The Jewish soul is God putting himself into his creation rather than creating his creation. And that's why the godly soul described in, in, in the beginning of the Torah, it doesn't say, God said, let there be a soul. It says he breathed the soul into the body that he had formed. This is why, possibly, anti-Semitism has been around for so long. Because somehow we all sense that there's something different. There's something different about a Jew. We can't figure out what it is, so it all depends on who is deciding. You ask the Nazis, what is it about Jews? You're not going to get such a nice answer. You ask other people, what is it about Jews? And they'll say, well, they're God's chosen, they're God's children, they're, you know, you got to help them and, and then you'll be blessed. So you have a wide range of, but the one thing they all agree, and we all agree, we don't fit. We're better, we're worse, we're different, we, but we don't fit. If we identify ourselves, if we could explain ourselves, if we can tell the world what makes us different, then we won't have to have them tell us what makes us different. And that's what it means to be a, a chosen people, a messenger to the world, and so on. We carry a little piece of God that is not created. Every creation has a little spark of God. Otherwise, it doesn't exist. But we're not, create, we're not carrying a piece of creation. We're carrying a piece of creator. And that gives us extra responsibilities. That gives us extra stamina to survive everything, despite all odds and so on. And that what, that's what it means to be a light to the nations, means you're bringing something from beyond the world into the world. If we can wrap our heads around that, we would understand ourselves a lot better. There was a big conference in Toronto years ago of psychologists and um, psychotherapists and one of the things they all agreed on, but would not publish, is that the therapy that works for other people doesn't work for Jews. <laughs> we have different insanities than everybody else. We have a unique kind of insanity. So when we're crazy, it's a different craziness, and, and you need a different kind of treatment. But they would not publish such a thing because it sounds so... Hmm? Crazy? <laughs> it sounds too much like uh, Nietzsche and the, you know, the different races. And, uh, sound terrible. What is it about God? All we hear way back from, from the times of, uh, of Aristotle and Plato, what we hear about God is that he is the original true existence, substance, from which everything else comes. And this true, original, indestructible, eternal substance is indestructible, it's infinite, it's beyond, it's indescribable, you're supposed to love it? What's to love? If God is this Aristotelian God, he's unmovable, he's unshakable, he's unreachable, he's untouchable. So first of all, what do you mean serve him? <laughs> serve him what? What do you get a guy who has everything? 
So what are you going to serve him? What are you going to give him that could possibly be meaningful to him when he is so perfect? So by describing him as such a perfect being, we've made him irrelevant. He might as well not exist. Secondly, even if you could serve him, what is there to love? What are you loving? Here's, here's the, the real secret of Judaism, which we have not shared with the world. And everybody says, you know, what have Jews brought to the world? Well, monotheism. You know how long ago that was? Have we done anything lately? And what is monotheism? We told people that no one else is God. Only God is God. That doesn't make him any more lovable. The real secret of Judaism is not monotheism. The real secret of Judaism is when God came down to Mount Sinai, he came down. He came down to Mount Sinai and told us all about himself. So when he said, don't kill, don't steal, don't even covet your neighbor's donkey, he wasn't, act, he wasn't only telling you what to do. He was describing himself. You want to know about me? Can I tell you what I like, what I dislike, my loves, my hates, my preferences? I'll tell you everything. It's okay when you eat cow. When you eat pig, it bothers me. It bothers me when, you, when you're angry at each other. I need you to get along and love your fellow Jew. I need you to honor your mother. Well, you need to honor her too, but I need it more. It's my commandment. I thought of it first. So when God says, honor your father and mother, he's describing himself. This is me. This is what it means to be God. So for example, he created the world in six days, by the end of the sixth day, he was done. So what did he do on the seventh day? Gunished. <laughs> so he rested. Aha! It's Shabbos. No. God had a holy day in which he is himself. Six days, he was creating the world. He wasn't being himself. He was involved in creation, like a carpenter. By the end of creation, God went back to being himself. That's why Shabbos is holy. So Shabbos is holy before he created the world. On Shabbos, he went back to being himself, like before creation. So it's not like if it had taken him eight days to create the world, he would have rested on the ninth. No. He created the world according to his needs. He didn't decide what he needed after he created it. So actually, what happened at Mount Sinai, and we call it revelation. What revelation took place at Mount Sinai? God revealed himself. What does that mean? We all knew there was a God. Adam and Eve spoke to God. Noah knew there was a God. Avram spoke to God. Yitzchak. What, what was revealed that we didn't know before? We knew there was a God. We had no idea what he was like. We had no idea that he cared. We had no idea that it bothers him if we do certain things and pleases him greatly if you do other things. So basically, God bared his soul at Mount Sinai. I mean, the most romantic, the most dramatic phrase, the first words of the Ten Commandments. The first words in the Ten Commandments, I am God, your God. I am yours. I, I identify with you. I belong to you. I'm yours. If we don't 
catch that, you know, if we don't hear that, if it's like God says, I am God, you're God, and we say, yeah, so what do you want? <laughs> no romance at all. God says, I am yours, we should respond with, and we are yours. We missed it. We were so overwhelmed by the power of the event that we didn't hear him. It's taken years. Finally, the Baal Shem Tov came around 300 years ago, and he said, okay, okay, it's taking you guys too long. Let me spell it out for you. God desperately needs you. He created the world because he needs you. Don't you hear him? He's been begging all these years. Be mine. And we said yes. We had no idea what we were saying yes to. We thought we were saying yes to orthodoxy. That's so mechanical. So, is God lovable? If God reaches out to us, initiates a relationship, and says, please be mine, how could you not love him? So we celebrate Pesach, right? We make a Seder you know, with the matzah, with the cups, with the dip this into that, and the murrah, and this. What are we celebrating? Coming out of Egypt? That was such a long time ago. What we're celebrating is that he came to take us out of Egypt. And no matter how long you're married, you never forget when you were first approached. He came to us and said, stop, let me, ta <laughs> let me take you away from all of this. Come with me, I need you. But we can't get over that. We should never get over that. So is God lovable? If you have any idea what God is, yes, he is lovable. He's irresistibly lovable because he's vulnerable. Does anyone in the world, all the religions, anyone in the world have any idea that God might be vulnerable? This is our message to the world if they're listening, if they're interested. And it can change the world. And I tell you this little. I get a phone call from a guy in Oregon. And he says, I'm a retired psychiatrist. I was born Jewish. But for the last 36 years, I've been practicing Christianity. But now, as I'm getting older, I feel like I would, I would like to be connected to my people. It's almost like I, I don't want to die alone. He says, what can I do to feel connected to my people? So I said, get a pair of tefillin. You'll put them on in the mornings. You'll feel connected to your people. He says, I can't do that. Every time I tried to do something Jewish, I've had a bad experience. I'll get tangled up in the straps and choke. I, I don't know what he was worried about. But he says, every time I do something Jewish, it's been a bad experience. So I said, uh, you know, nobody's Jewish because it's been a good experience. <laughs> you feel like a Jew if you do the things God needs from Jews. If you do the things God needs from non-Jews, <laughs> then you don't feel like a Jew. He says, God needs? I'm not familiar with that. So I'm getting really impatient with this guy. I don't know who he is. He calls me out of the blue, asks me for advice, doesn't like my advice. Now he's debating theology with me. So I said impatiently, I said, look, God is infinite, right? He says, yeah. Infinitely smart? Yeah. Infinitely patient? <laughs> Unlike me. 
infinitely uh, forgiving, infinitely kind? Yes, yes, yes. Well, then he must also be infinitely vulnerable. Because he's infinite. This guy says, vulnerable? God is vulnerable? God is almighty. Now remember, he's a retired psychiatrist. So I said, uh, doctor, are you suggesting that being vulnerable is a weakness? <laughs> Got very flustered. Hangs up the phone. A couple of days later, he calls back. Doesn't give me his name. He says, where do I get the tefillin? I said, why all of a sudden? He says, well, my professional background doesn't allow me to accept the Christian message. I said, after 36 years? He says, you got to understand my background. In my professional background, we know that if a man says, I love you very, very, very much, more than anything else in the world. But if you're not interested, I don't really care. Go to hell. <laughs> that is not love at all. He does not love. That love is manipulation. The, the religion that teaches God is love, God loves you, God will do anything for you, but can you touch him? Can you hurt him? No. No, he's God. So you want me to save you? Fine. You don't want? Go to hell forever. He says, Where, where's the love? There's no love. In other words, if God is not vulnerable, he can't love. If God is not vulnerable, he's certainly not lovable. Is God's vulnerability a weakness? Does that mean he's imperfect? Or does that actually show how perfect he is? So whatever the theologists, the theologians are going to argue and debate, can God need and still be perfect? Let them argue it out. Judaism says, God is so perfect that he can cry, he can hurt, he can have pleasure, he can have pain. He's real. He's a living God. Not a perfect little statue. This is basically Tanya's theme. A Jew is more a part of God than you ever suspected, and God is more a part of his world than you ever suspected. And between the two, we can love him. Makes a little sense? Mm -hmm. Any questions? Of course. Um, <clears throat> when you particularly said God breathed life into a man, and if Christianity might be looked at as a they wouldn't be here if it weren't for us. Um, I guess I'm just struggling with this idea of then how are we sort of different than, except for the covenant. So, um, and how do we love everyone? And then if God has everything, including vulnerability, then does God God have everything, including evil. Well, uh, unless you believe in Satan, where does evil come from, if not from God? The point is, he hates it. Of course it comes from, he created it. But he hates it. So, it's not that... Um, he doesn't know evil. He knows it very well. Doesn't like it. 
doesn't want us to feed into it. Now, how are we supposed to love other people? Um, if God created us all vulner, what is the word? Vulnerably, <laughs> vulnerably. Then He needs every part of His creation. There is nothing unnecessary. There is nothing extra. There is nothing superfluous in His creation. So if I am fulfilling my purpose, serving him the way he needs me to serve him, but the non-Jews are not doing what they're supposed to do and what he needs from them, how can I be happy? God is not getting what he wants. Now I can say, well, I'm doing my part. Well, yeah, that gets you off the hook, but it doesn't complete the job. So if God needs everyone to do their part, then I can't be happy unless everyone is doing their part. So it has to concern me if non-Jews anywhere in the world are not serving and fulfilling their purpose or their part in creation. And if they do, that should make me very happy. So <clears throat> by, by recognizing that God has an investment a vested interest in his creation, that means every part of creation has to be important to me. Because it's significant to him. So we can't dismiss anyone. We can't ignore anything. The entire world and everything in it must live up to its potential so that God gets what he wants out of his creation. Now, it's very important when we, tell, when we tell people who we are. Like, how do we describe ourselves? We say, we're the chosen people. Actually, we don't say that. We never say that. But they come to us, and they say, so you're the chosen people. <laughs> and we try to deny it, and they're not buying it. It's not a good description. We were given a mission, that's true. But why, why were we given that mission? Why were we chosen to do this job? Because we're Jews. We didn't become Jews by choice. So it's not like God needed a special people. So he made a contest like American Idol. <laughs> and we all went and, uh, what is it called? Uh, audition. Auditioned. And we won. So we were chosen. No, it's not like that at all. That's horrible. That is such an arrogant statement. It's such an arrogant concept. We beat out the competition. Oh, come on. God created a Jewish people because he needed a Jewish people. Then he gave us the mission of being a light to the nation. So are we Jewish because we were chosen to be Jewish? No. We created Jewish. So what were we chosen for? For the mission. God chose Jews to do this mission. What made us Jewish? We were created Jewish. Different soul. So here's how it works. Technically. God breathes a godly soul into Adam in addition to his human soul. Now, this godly soul doesn't really take, you know, like a transplant, it doesn't really take to a physical body. So, Adam had that soul. Eve had that soul. They couldn't pass it on to their children. It was not part of their genetic makeup. It was like an extra. The next generation, God gave that soul to one of the children. A couple of generations later, God gave that soul to Noah. But nobody inherited that soul from their parent. One of Noah's children was given that soul. And finally, Avraham has that godly soul. But he worked it. He sacrificed for it. 
ran around telling the world about God, even though they didn't want to hear it because they were all idol worshippers. By the time he reached 90 or 75, whatever, his godly soul had so permeated into his system, into his body, that it became a permanent part of his makeup. So that one of his children actually inherited the soul from him. That was the first time in history. One of his sons. The other didn't. Now the son that did inherit, Yitzchak, both his children inherited the godly soul. It lasted, it took in one of them, it didn't take in the other. Yaakov and Esav. Yaakov, the third generation of inherited, was so permeated, the godly soul was so much a part of him that from then on, a Jew cannot give birth to anything but a Jew. The soul has become a permanent part of our makeup. And that's why we are called the children of Israel. That's Jacob's name. We're also the children of Avraham and Yitzchak, but that's not guaranteed. Because we are the children of Yaakov, of Yisrael, it's guaranteed that we create Jewish children because a fish gives birth to a fish, a human being gives birth to a human being, a Jew gives birth to a Jew. beautiful thing about it is you weren't given this godly soul to enjoy it. You were given this godly soul to have an effect on the rest of the world. And that's why Jews are spread throughout the world. We didn't choose that. We didn't want that. But we need to be there. We need to be everywhere. We need to bring our godly potential to every part of the globe and have an effect. So going back to your question, we can't dismiss anyone because we're not here for ourselves. We're here to serve, to serve God's purpose, which involves the entire world. It sounds very noble, doesn't it? Yeah, so, so if we're so special and so godly and so noble, what happened to us? Ah, what happened to us is 2,000 years of abuse. That's not kid stuff. So we're severely damaged. We have an inferiority complex. I mean, one famous rabbi recently came out with this unbelievable statement. He said, you know, I never believed that Jews were different. I hate that idea. It sounds so racist. I'm not sure if he was a reform or conservative rabbi. But he said, the idea that Jews are different, have a godly soul, I hate that idea. I never agreed with it. It bothers me. But lately, I'm starting to see it. We are different. We are unique. But what makes us unique? We are the miner's canary of the world. Our role in the world is to die first <laughs> as a warning for others. Whoa, you have a really high self-image. <laughs> That's what you think you are? <laughs> like, the, like the miner's canary? Mm -hmm. When the air goes bad, you're the first to die so that others are... That's what you think? Boy, do we have an inferiority complex. <laughs> And it's not surprising. For 2,000 years, we've been told that we're wrong, we're bad, and we're a disease. <laughs> How would you feel if you were told that for 2,000 years? And not just told, treated like that. So we need a lot of healing. We need a lot of healing. Amen. The state of Israel, and particularly the Six-Day War, was such a cathartic 
event. It took us from such despair to at least a little hope. Hey, we're not so bad, huh? We can, he we can hold our heads up. But it's not enough. It's not enough to say, hey, we, dis we discovered that we can really fight. We're good at tanks and planes. And that's, that's our pride? That's like saying, we are proud. <laughs> we are proud despite the fact that we're Jews. Okay, we're Jews, but we can fight. That's not good enough. We have to be proud of who we are, not despite who we are. And Tanya does that. Tanya is a real cure, even for 2,000 years of abuse. It tells you who you are, it explains who you are, makes you comfortable with who you are, and makes you proud to be who you are. It's indispensable. Who else knows how to heal 2,000 years of abuse? There's no pill for that. <laughs> Yeah. Question. Um, you said that Hashem is vulnerable. What is he vulnerable to? Or maybe I, I'm not understanding the word vulnerable. Let's, let's, let's examine the word. To be vulnerable means um, you are some way dependent on someone else. That's vulnerable. If you're, if you're not dependent on anybody, you're not vulnerable. God gave us freedom of choice. He desperately wants a relationship with us, but a relationship has to involve free choice. So he gives us free choice and, and wants a relationship. Well, that's very vulnerable. A man um, proposes to a woman, <laughs> he's very vulnerable, because she could say no. What was that guy proposed in, in, in front of a stadium full of people, and she said no? <laughs> I mean, how painful is that? And it was on television, too. So, what does he actually need? A relationship with us. What makes him vulnerable? We can say no. What we, happens to him when we say no? I, I have no idea what infinite pain feels like. So he feels infinite pain. But I also don't know what infinite love feels like. I don't know what infinite pleasure feels like. So we do know he experiences pleasure and love and hate and pain, but it's infinite, so we can't really picture what that might be like. We have some inkling because we also have pleasure and love and pain, but, you know, a tiny sample. Now, because God is infinite, there isn't a possibility that in the end he will not get what he needs. So the vulnerability is temporary. It's like that guy who asked the woman out and she said no, but tomorrow she's going to say yes. Or 3,373 3, years later, we're going to say yes. So he's not really vulnerable. Every day, every moment, until that happens, it's not like he wants to have a relationship with us 3,000 years from now. He wants it the day he said it, and he didn't get it. So he's temporarily vulnerable. Yeah. He won't be permanently damaged. But that's where we get our vulnerability from, because we're created in His image. Why do we need to connect with another person, to have, to have an intimate relationship? 
Where do we get that need from? It's so vulnerable, it makes us so vulnerable. Who needs this? But if I knew I was going to get that girl sooner or later, I wouldn't be worried. I wouldn't be really vulnerable. Well, I don't know that he's worried. <laughs> but, but it hurts. Every day that she says no hurts. There are Jewish souls that have no bodies. They have no body. They have no body. And when a, when a convert converts, that soul will, one of those souls will enter the body. So he's literally like being created that day. So is that a reincarnation? Uh, no, reincarnation. <coughs> Reincarnation means a person who's already had a life right. is having a second life. This doesn't have to be a second life. This could be the first time the soul is embodied. Oh, okay. Right. Now, mystically, if you really want to know, we're told that all the converts are pretty much predestined. Mm -hmm. It's not like anybody can decide at any time that they're going to become Jewish. It doesn't happen. Otherwise, we'd be inundated. You know. When, when um, Abraham and Sarah inspired the people of their generation, they didn't actually become Jewish, but they picked up some... You know, and from those sparks, uh, there are individuals who are born destined to convert. Or to be even more mystical than that, every time Avraham and Sarah were intimate, and they didn't have children for 80 years, every time they were intimate, they, they affected a soul. But it didn't become a child. The souls of converts are those souls. And that's why converts identify themselves as the son of Avraham or the daughter of Sarah. Because it's spiritually correct. They're, 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 they're their children. Uh, Reader's Digest. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's a, good, it's a good question. First of all, there is a mystical part of Torah that was given at Mount Sinai. But like the Talmud, it wasn't written down until many years later. So when God revealed himself, he revealed many things. Some committed to writing on the spot, the five books, and then some to be written later, and then some to be recorded um, by the rabbis, the sages, the, and the Zohar is one, of them, is one of those. So in the Zohar we're told about souls and what happens with them and coming and going. That's number one. Number two, this is a physical reality. A soul is a living being. There are people who had the experience, who, who are conscious of their soul coming, their soul leaving, their soul having been somebody else in the past. It, it's an experience. People have, you know, people say, what do you know about heaven and hell? Have you been there? Somebody has. People have been there and, and come back. Uh, a little more than a near-death experience. <laughs> the next step up, you know. <laughs> but if you can have a near-death experience, you know, it shouldn't be impossible to imagine a person who dies and comes back. I mean, if you can live once, you can live again. I have a question. Hmm? Oh, thank you. Um, when I was a child, um, I used to think, I used to be afraid of God. I mean, you know, you're going to get punished if you do this, God's watching, you better not do it. It's all about fear and punishment. 
Uh, now I have a very different relationship with God. I think God is there for me, and um, uh, but and, and it's not based on punishment and not caring and fear. It's about me. If I take my will back, I'm shutting God out. But if I try to, so what is this business with fear? Why do I have to be afraid of God? Be afraid. Be very afraid. <laughs> I can't imagine what it was like in the times of the temple where there were prophets, thousands of prophets. There were daily miracles happening at the temple. All Jews were living in a holy land. There was a king who was a holy man, Saul or David. And despite all of that, people sinned, even idolatry. I could imagine God would be quite angry. And when he's angry, it's scary. Be afraid. Don't mess with him. So fear of God was probably a very real thing back then. But realistically, today, for us, 2,000 years of homelessness, 3,000 years since God last spoke to us, if we do a sin, could he possibly be angry at us? Because if he, if he is, then he's a monster. He puts us through all of this, doesn't bother talking to us <laughs> more than once in 3,000 years. <laughs> and then if we forget to do a mitzvah, he's angry at us? What kind of God are you talking about? Today, if a Jew does a sin, God has got to be blaming himself. He has to. He created the sin. He created the evil inclination. He created the exile. He broke up our tradition, our te teaching, and our learning, and our stability, and oh, time and time and time again. What, we're not going to sin? He's got to be blaming himself. So when we go to services on Yom Kippur, it's not out of fear. But you think he's out to punish you? For what? For what? For being human? Not possible. Instead, when we realize God is still vulnerable he still depends on us, needs us, wants us, and so on, no matter how bad we've been. The response to that kind of love is that it scares you. Can love be scary? <laughs> oh, yeah, it can. <laughs> so there are two kinds of love. There's a love that you can respond to. Uh, the typical, bye, I love you, I love you, see? Hmm? <laughs> I love you just as much as you love me, so there. <laughs> and by the way, you shouldn't do that. First of all, you shouldn't say I love you every time you have a conversation. It kind of loses its meaning. Secondly, if someone says to you, I love you, don't say I love you. Why must you start an argument every time? <laughs> Why can't you take a compliment? <laughs> it's so bad. I mean, if you stop and think about it. I get up the courage, and it's not easy. I get up the courage to tell my wife how much I love her. Not often, but I finally do it. And I say, I love you. She says, I love you. It's like, 
Is that all I get to say about myself? <laughs> I just said, I love you. And she says, okay, enough about you. Now, I love you. See, that's all I get to say. That's it. I'll, I'll never say it again. <laughs> Don't cut me off like that. I'm opening up. Don't change the subject to you. Receive. Receive. Take a compliment. Stay on topic. So if a man says to a woman, I love you very much, she should say, Ma, you have good taste. <laughs> See, it's about him. <laughs> anyway, so there's a kind of love that is warm and fuzzy because you can do the same. She loves you, and you can do the same. You have exactly the same kind of love. But when God says, I love you, it's scary. Not because we're afraid something's going to go wrong. It's because I can't love you back the way you love me. I can't. So I'm left speechless. That's called fear. So when we come on Yom Kippur, we're, we're not afraid God is going to punish us. How is that even possible? How could you even consider such a thing? The days of awe, for us, is the awesome devotion, the awesome hang-up that God has on us. No matter what we do, no matter how we behave, He won't quit on us. That's pretty scary. Because, can you love back like that? So it, it humbles you. Anything that humbles you is called fear. But it doesn't mean fear of punishment. That's got to go. So, it's not, it's not only that you have changed. He's changed too. There was a time when he could legitimately, justifiably be angry. Now he can't. Not anymore. Not after what we've been through. So in relation to that, I think I've read in uh, the writings of Harav Cook that uh, he sometimes translates fear as awe. So it's much, you know, yeah. transforms the relationship. But even if it's just fear, mm -hmm. it's not fear of punishment, it's fear of him. Fear of punishment, I mean, that, that's... It should. Right. Should. It's not mm -hmm. fear of punishment, it's because you're so in awe, you even have a fear. Is that it? I mean, well, you can have fear without awe. Fear of the unknown? No. Fear of the unknown is m more like fear of punishment. Yeah. You don't know how you're going to get punished, but you're going to get punished. I think we well, do feel that some people get punished. Seems like God is picking on some people. Yeah. Well, the righteous, it's in the Zohar, it does say that the righteous are severely tested. Oh, severely tested does not mean punished. Well. Let's not, let's not do that. Let's not do that. We have a hang-up, and, and some rabbis actually perpetuate this thing. Every time someone suffers, it's punishment for sin. Mm -hmm. That is so not true. Mm -hmm. So not true. And the best example, or the best proof, one of the worst times in Jewish history was slavery in Egypt. 210 years of horrendous slavery. For what sin? The Torah hadn't even been given yet. So right off the bat we see suffering may have many reasons. Punishment is only one of them. And if it is punishment then it has to fit the crime. Mm -hmm. What sin is punishable by 200 years of slavery. There's no such sin. What sin is punishable by a Holocaust? There's no such sin. You stub your toe, that's because you sinned. <laughs> now we're even. <laughs>
God do we have what when he watches the six million being exterminated? What could he be thinking? I mean, we can't even fathom what he could be thinking. Of course, thinking is not even a word, but it's still incomprehensible to me. Really? Yeah, it's still, it's still almost, it's, it's truly unbelievable. Yeah. Yes. The only way we can come to terms with it is when he explains himself. Until then, there's no way. I want to tell you a really beautiful thing. Why has he abandoned us for 3,000 years? Has he? Well, he hasn't spoken to us. Oh, yeah. He's a man of few words. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I see that as a great compliment. I just imagine some angels coming to God and saying, uh, you know, it's been a while since, <laughs> since you've talked to them. Maybe you should have Mount Sinai happen like once a year. And God says, no, I told them. They know, they know. It's a great compliment. But it, but it is a mystery that... Uh, if he really wants us to be good, shouldn't he be standing over our head, nudging us like a mother? <laughs> do it, do it, come on, it's late, go, do it. You might say that he does do it in some mysterious, sneaky ways, you know, this conscience that we have. <laughs> That's maybe him speaking, I don't know. But it, I, I think it's really a great compliment. God says, look, here's what it is. Get your act together. If it takes you 3,000 years, that's fine. Get your act together. It's a big compliment, I think. But listen to this beautiful thing. Elie Wiesel is asked constantly to explain why there was a Holocaust. As if it was his fault or something. Because <laughs> he was there. And of course, he, I mean, he always says, what do, you, what do you want from me? How am I supposed to know? One time... He gave this really insightful answer. He said to the guy who was asking, he says, I'm sorry, I, I can't tell you. <laughs> the guy said, you know why, but you won't tell me? He said, I can't, I can't tell you. He said, what does that mean? He says, if I tell you, then you will become a Nazi. And the guy said, what are you talking about? I'm a Jew. Why would I become a Nazi? Wiesel said, Why are you asking me? Why do you keep asking that question? Because it bothers you. Six million people. Bothers you. Can't sleep. So you come to me, and you say, Tell me, why was there a Holocaust? And if I give you a good answer, and I explain to you why there had to be a Holocaust. And you understand my answer. And you say, oh, okay, now I can sleep. See, you've become a Nazi. <laughs> if the question ever stops bothering you and you become comfortable with a Holocaust, <laughs> you're a Nazi. Who else is comfortable with a Holocaust? I mean, even Nazis are not comfortable anymore. So, should we find an answer? Would you accept any answer? Of course not. No, I think the question isn't why humanly there was a Holocaust. The question is why would God permit the Holocaust? Mm -hmm. And if we know the answer, that doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to be Nazis. No, if we know the answer, we will become comfortable. And we shouldn't. We should never become comfortable with, the pr with evil. Even though we know there must be a very good reason for evil to exist. No, we're uncomfortable knowing that Hashem permits evil. Yes. We need an explanation for it. Yes. I am not comfortable that there's no explanation. That's right. That's right. So, really, the only... Cor the only um, acceptable answer 
the only acceptable, bring the six million back, then we're even. Anything less than that, I don't get it. I don't want to get it. See, that's the point. The reason we can't find an answer for the Holocaust is because we won't accept any answer. that we have no um, choice but to want to accept is that there is some evil in, in, in God. Right? Why would he permit that? I have no idea where to even think, where to even begin thinking. I don't know. Now, it's not surprising he's God. So, if, I, if, if you want to, want to balance it, I don't know why he allowed six million to be killed, and I don't know why he refused to let all Jews be killed, even though that's what the Nazis wanted. So I don't know why he chose these to die and these to live. But if I think only, why did he make people die? That's half the story. Look at the big picture. Jews have been killed through the, through the ages and Jews survived everybody. What's going on? Now, if I don't celebrate life, if I'm not gleeful that God gives life, then I really can't complain about his taking life. I am upset with death to the degree that I worship life. If I give up on life, then I can't complain about death. So you got to keep a balance. We always, when something goes wrong, we think of God. And when something goes wonderful, no. Well, I, I think sometimes it's the opposite. We always thank God for something that happens, but we never blame Him when something doesn't go wrong. We don't blame Him? We're the best at it. <laughs> well, we have protests for everything, but we don't have damnation for bad things. Uh, we have some chosen words. <laughs> Not fit to be print, <laughs> not fit to print, but you know, we, we are very angry at God. And it's an amazing thing also. A Jew who is angry at God is a good Jew. A Christian angry at God, he's out. You cannot be angry at God in Christianity. Or in Islam? <laughs> Forget about it. <laughs> is it. Is it possible that Hashem had nothing to do with Holocaust, that it was just basically either it was not there? or not watching at all, not interfering in any way, that we did it, or meaning humanity did it to itself? Well, and he's not much of a god, is he? Yeah. Falls asleep on the job? <laughs> no, no, no. No, there's nothing wrong with blaming him. He expects it. After all, I am God. Well, you want the privileges? You got to take the hits. <laughs> I have a question, if I may. How do we know that we're still in a relationship with God if He hasn't called and He hasn't texted and He hasn't been 3,000 years? How do we know that we're still chosen and we're still His beloved? That is a very good question. Do you know? No. Really? You're not sure you're in a relationship with God? No, if He hasn't called in so long and hmm. He hasn't. Then tell me, why do you feel so guilty when you do something wrong? Because we have a conscience. Uh huh. We have a conscience. It's a very bad thing to have an ungodly conscience. <laughs> That's like really sick guilt. <laughs> the real guilt, all real guilt, has to do with a damaged relationship. If there's no damage to a relationship, there is no guilt. A person feels guilty because, I mean, let's say, you do something really bad as a child. Nobody knows. But you're sure your mother is not going to love you anymore. That's the guilt. You do something wrong and you know your husband is not going to respect you anymore. Or you do something wrong and you know God is very not pleased, un unimpressed. If nobody is reacting, then you have no guilt. 
legitimate guilt. When a person says, I know everybody forgives me, but I can't forgive myself. You're just wallowing. Get at, you know, knock it off. You are forgiven. Everybody important in your life hasn't changed their feelings towards you. Knock it off. So, well, I don't forgive myself. Excuse me, you're not the judge. <laughs> you're the criminal. <laughs> How did you get to be the judge? <clears throat> So real guilt, and, and, and we suffer real guilt, it's because we know God is not pleased. Because God is not pleased. Huh? Because God is not pleased, you say? Which means he still cares. And that, 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 that's our evidence for still having a relationship with him? That's evidence. We don't really need evidence, because I'm not giving up on this relationship. <laughs> I, I don't know what he's thinking, but I'm not giving up. And I have a sneaky suspicion that he's sitting up there in heaven saying exactly the same thing. Jews ignore me, they curse me, they hate me, but I'm not giving up on them. So come and um, do something, like show yourself, say hello. You know, you know. Every, now, every now and then, every now and then, if we're listening, I mean, you know, the Six-Day War in June of 67 makes most of the miracles in the Bible look like child's play. I mean, it was awesome. It was totally unnatural. You're fighting a war with three armies and you lose 400 men and wipe out their... I mean, this splitting the sea is nothing. <laughs> What's God's ability to think of things on the micro level? Like, we think six million people and think of this being a lot of 3,000 years. But the God 3,000 years could be 10 months ago. And he could be happy that the Jews didn't die, that thank God only six million. I mean, I mean, like, what? Do numbers really matter? Numbers don't matter, but in the opposite direction. Is God more upset about the loss of six million than the loss of one? If the loss of one innocent person bothers him, then it bothers him infinitely. Can't be any more than that. So yeah, we're very impressed with, or depressed, mm -hmm with the number. To God, any one of those is already infinitely upsetting. So why did he let it happen? Can't, can't even begin to I have no idea. And besides, I don't want to know why. I really don't want to know why. I just want it to reverse. Fix it. Fix it. Don't explain it. In the Torah, we very, very rarely hear the question, why? Like, why is this night different from all other nights? We don't ask that. We don't ask why. Manishtana means what is different, not why. When we do ask why, we don't want an answer. It's a complaint. It's not a question. Why do the righteous suffer? You really want to know? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, I don't really want to know. I just want it to stop. Amen. See, and our children know this. Why don't you want to know? Because that doesn't make it any better. Okay, but still it would be good to know. Out of curiosity? Well, out of knowledge. Yeah, but then I would ask what? I wouldn't ask why. But why, why is asking why a sin? It's not a sin. There's just no answer. Now look, our children know this very well. You say to your child, it's uh, 9.30, you have to go to sleep. The kid says, why? Did you ever try explaining it? <laughs> well, we go impatient and we say, because I said so. But that's because we're impatient, not because he shouldn't no, no. ask. The child is not asking. 
When a child says, why do I have to go? It means I'm not going. <laughs> There's no question there. It means, no, I'm not going. But then sometimes there are honest Yeah, but usually what we mean is what? What is the benefit of suffering? That's a good question. Why does my uncle suffer? I don't want an answer. So when, when Pharaoh decides to make the enslavement even worse, after Moshe speaks to him the first time, Moshe comes back to God and says, why did you make it worse? God doesn't answer him. Because he didn't want an answer. He wanted an end. <clears throat> if you want a, a very brief but very meaningful um, advice on how to make your marriage better, don't use the word why. <laughs> makes a world of difference. You know, when you said that to me yesterday, it was really upsetting. Why? <laughs> now you're in trouble. <laughs> you're, you upset me and then you ask why? That is so... Huh? Never say why. It really bothers me when you do that. Why? First of all, I have no idea. Things bother me. I don't know why. I didn't, I didn't make this up. It bothers me. Right? Secondly, I ask you not to do something because it really bothers me. And you say, why? That sounds like the fact that it bothers you is not a good enough reason for me not to do it. Give me a good reason. Give me a why. Maybe then I'll... But the fact that you don't like it, come on, that's not it. In other words, when you say why, you are rejecting the person in favor of an explanation. You'd rather have an explanation than me. <laughs> why? <laughs> now, if you think about it, really, most of the time when we ask why, we really mean what? In fact, do this. You know there's this big book of why? Anybody know this? You saw it? You've seen it? Yeah. It's a big book. <laughs> and it's called The Big Book of Why. Have you read it? Why does water flow downhill? In the big book of why, it tells you. It says because the molecules in the water are fluid. Oh, that's why. <laughs> why is water... Why does water run downhill? Because it's slippery. You, didn't, you haven't explained anything. Most of the questions... And you really should look at the book. Why does something... Well, we don't really know why, but what happens when this... I read it to my children. We were cracking up. Every other entry. Well, we don't really understand why, the, but <laughs> in science, there is never an answer to the question why. Never. Science doesn't know why anything. Science is an observation of what happens. We have no idea why it happens. We just record what happens. <coughs> why does fire consume? <laughs> I don't know why, but I can tell you what consume means. What happens is the molecules of the thing come apart and some become vapor and some... Why? Because fire burns. Why? We don't know why. We don't know why anything. We know what. And if you ask what, you might get a good answer. And that's what intelligence is made of. You don't get smart by asking why. Do you have any explanation for reincarnation? <clears throat> Since, uh... 
an explanation or? Yeah, um, what is the reason for it? I wouldn't ask why. Yeah, the, the, purpose, <laughs> the purpose of reincarnation is either to undo some damage you did in your past life or to complete the mission that you left incomplete the first time around. Or cause new damage. Now in, huh? Or cause new damage. Or make new tsars. Um, in, in Buddhism, incar reincarnation is a, is a natural ongoing cycle. That's just the way it is. Souls keep coming and going, coming and going. If you want to break out of the cycle, you have to achieve enlightenment. 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 And then you stop that cycle. In Judaism, reincarnation has a specific purpose. If you finish your job, there's absolutely no reason to keep cycling. So if a soul does come back, it means there's something more that it can, that it can accomplish that it didn't do in the first, first time around. Souls change gender or not? Okay. That, that's how, in the course of all of our incarnations, we get to do the mitzvahs of women and the mitzvahs of men, so that by the end, every soul has had all the mitzvahs. Wow. So part of the reason women don't put on tefillin is because you did that in your last life. You don't have to do it again. If you, <laughs> if you did, right, you wouldn't have to come back as a man. Uh, another, another reason women don't have to put on tefillin, I mean, if tefillin is so great, what do you mean? What do you mean you don't? Another reason for it is because in marriage, a man and a woman become one. They're really s the same soul separated at birth. So if the man half of the soul is putting on tefillin, it covers both souls. But what's the harm in doing it? None. Well, why isn't she doing no harm. It? No harm. But the, my point is this. If a guy is not putting on tefillin, he's going to have to answer to his wife. Yeah. So I say to these single guys, and I say, we'd like to put on film. Said, no. I say, oh, you're going to be in trouble. Your wife is going to be very angry. You decided unilaterally not to do it. You didn't even consult with her. It's her mitzvah too. So don't cheat her just because you're in a bad mood. That's, that is, that's part of the bigger mystery. God says, in the beginning, I created heaven and earth, and never mentions heaven again. <laughs> that's it. Okay, enough about heaven. Let's talk about earth. That's amazing, huh? Mm -hmm. That tells you where his interest lies. By some off chance, reincarnation was a human invention. The, 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 the written Torah wouldn't, which would support that notion, since there's nothing in it. Oh. Well, I think part of the reason is because reincarnation, souls coming, going, dibuk, not incarnation, but um, what is it called? Possession. Possession. These are things people are going to experience. You don't have to be told. It's part of human experience. Right, but so is menstruation, so is eating and drinking. There are right. no laws about that. Right. Oh, but there are no laws about reincarnation. <laughs> but it is mentioned in the Zohar. Yes. So that's our oral tradition, which is uh, as important as the written. So we, it is talked about. Yeah, yeah. No, but 
But we did not discover reincarnation from a book. No, it's, it's part of our experience. The Zohar tells you why, which soul will be incarnated, but that there's reincarnation, I mean, people knew that. Because all, all human beings, with or without religion, have these uh, superstitions. <laughs> Um, yeah, people know that there is no Santa Claus. <laughs> but ghosts, for example. Are there ghosts? Are there spirits? Well, if there are, we didn't read it in the book. People claim to have had the experience. And the claim goes back for as far as, 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 as history remembers. There's never been a time that people weren't talking about ghosts. Dragons are real and unicorns are real. Possibly, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And if they're not real, they're almost real. Like a unicorn. It's a horse with somebody's horn. <laughs> so it's just a little rearrangement of fact. But it's not a mythical creature. So th there are things that, you know, how do, how do the Buddhists know about reincarnation? It's not a religious principle. Like, how do the Chinese know about the chakras? <laughs> because they discovered it. It's there. So, ghosts are real. There are disembodied spirits. That's why everybody always talks about it. <laughs> the question is, do ghosts really say boo? <laughs> I don't think so. Why they talk about it? About boo? Now, most serious ghost people don't, don't think it's a... But I see this joke. I don't know why I find this so funny. But I just, I don't know why. This guy says, you know, the other day, I was walking down the street, and I, I found this dead baby ghost. But then I looked a little closer. It was just an old handkerchief. <laughs> So do ghosts really like uh, a white sheet with holes and goes boo? Um, ghosts are, are serious business, not like Casper. <laughs> I mean, if you can have a soul in a body, why can't you have a soul without a body? N not that that proves anything, but if people say they experience the soul without a body, wh why? W I wouldn't doubt it. So could there be a Jewish ghost? Oh, of course. Really? Jews make the best ghosts. <laughs> <laughs> um, what would cause a Jew to be disembodied? Not to make, you know, have his soul... Uh, there's, there, there's, one of, there's one of two things. Sometimes when a person passes away and the soul needs to return to, you know, wherever souls come from and, and they can't find their way back. So they're kind of um, neither here nor there. So that's, that's called um, wandering souls. That's what dibuk comes from. The soul will attach itself to a body you know, without being invited because it can't stand being nowhere. And that's called possession. And from what I know, it happens these days too, among meditators. Mm -hmm. Because when they really block out all things and empty their mind, these homeless souls will make themselves at home there. Even though the concept of Dibbuk doesn't really exist anymore because officially it was wiped out. That's demonic possession. Demons. Oh, so it's not. But souls are still... Transcendental meditation, it's bad to empty your mind. Your mind should always be, should always have content, yeah. <clears throat> so is uh, uh, exorcism a real thing? It is. Of course, there are a lot of charlatans too. 
but then so are some psychiatrists. <laughs> they are charlatans, but there is there is the real thing of of uh, convincing a soul to leave. Jewish souls. So that's why one of the reasons why we walk the soul out of the house after Shiva, our uh, eighth day. So yeah, souls are real. Mm -hmm. There was one Jewish soul that inhabited or possessed a body, and the priests of the town came with a, with a procession, with crucifixes and everything else, and they exorcised the demon. But some rabbi spoke to that soul afterwards, and he said, look, I was a sinner, and I blew it really bad, and that's why I was banished from heaven and wandering around, and I'm a pretty bad Jew. But when they came in with those crucifixes, I got out of there fast. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, what happens if you don't pay your exorcist? You get repossessed. I know, it's pretty bad. Anyway, it's been a pleasure. If uh, you have the opportunity to learn Tanya, go for it, go for it. It's, it's, it is the best medicine for the Jewish soul. <laughs>